Yes, hello and uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Maybe also, I was going to say good night. Uh, we uh, thank you so much for joining us at this webinar, the Plant Records webinar on December 3rd. Uh, together with me, Howard Ostgard from Botanical Software, we have Dr. Wahid Arsad from Candide and also Greg Payton from the Dorsa Arboretum. I'll introduce them uh, properly. Uh, maybe we should uh, uh, stop sharing and, and just have a bit of a shared screen moment uh, for a second here while, while we start. Um, so uh, yes, uh, many of you are familiar with uh, Greg Payton, but maybe you could introduce yourself uh, Greg, to the old group. Uh, sure, I see a few names that may or, or, or may not know me. I am uh, Greg Payton, Director of Living Collections at the Dawes Arboretum, uh, Central Ohio in the uh, US. I um, uh, have been with the Arboretum here for uh, going on uh, 25 years this uh, winter, so uh, fairly uh, familiar with the place. Um, you know, started off in plant records, uh, I became director of the uh, curation department uh, a few years ago, and uh, as as Jessica Long will attest to, is also here with us. Uh, I just can't get it out of my system, so I still enjoy installing labels and uh, you know checking plants. But that's actually good for me because I get to see the plants and uh, know what we have. So having the eyes on the plants is very important. Yes, and and also today uh, we have also uh, Dr. Wahid Arsad from Candide. So. Most of you may have known or got uh, hold of the news uh, about botanical software joining Candide. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that uh, later on today, but uh, maybe you also could give a, share a few words about your background, Wade. Yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, good to uh, see you all again. Uh, familiar faces, nice to see you again. Um, yeah, so I suppose I could call myself a recovering academic. Um, I did my PhD in collaboration with the Millennium Seed Bank Partnership at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. And before that, I had a little stint in the herbarium uh, at Q, but also a few bits with the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh uh, and kind of coming from a research and conservation focus. But uh, since a year and a half ago, I've joined Candide Gardening and Botanical Software more recently. So yeah, looking forward to today talking about augmented reality, which uh, yeah, I'll hand over back to Havard for the time being. Yeah, so, uh, so today we have two main topics. Uh, as always, there's always room for questions uh, at any time and uh, we'll, we'll have some discussions at the end. Uh, so, uh, as we have discussed and shared with you previously, we want to start off with the, uh, a bit of a follow-up from our plant record conference, uh, uh, where there was a number of questions, and then after that we will kick off with the main presentation for today, uh, which uh, Wahid will look after. So, uh, at the conference, uh, first of all, in the seasonal, uh, what should I say, of, of gratitude and thanksgiving and everything. We're so grateful for everybody joined. It was so fun. So thank you for that. <laughs> and um, for those of you who haven't know, uh, on our website, um, we have uh, we have uh, the, uh, the articles from the conference. There's one slide series here with, uh, if you go to down here, recent posts, you can get access to all the different resources from the conference slides and videos. So the whole conference was recorded. So uh, feel free to uh, peruse that. Uh, prior to that, we also uh, posted, uh, there were a number of questions listed uh, during our presentation, which we followed up and they are available here. So uh, go here and look at the Q&A questions that were listed. Um, since we wrote this, there's been some more clarification. So I want to address that a bit today before we move over to the main presentation. Um, for those who have not heard about the Candide Botanical Software um, sort of join or merger, you could watch this video and then you'll see our presentation from the conference if you want more details about that. Uh, and then uh, one of the questions that came up is the, the story about uh, Iris and Floria Handheld there's been some confusion around that. Uh, so we tried to summarize the answers to those questions. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about Floria Handel and RSBG. So 
I'm not going to go through all these questions here, uh, but I feel I suggest everybody reads uh, who are interested go and have a look at these questions and answers, um, especially the one at database hosting and so forth and so on. Um, unless there's somebody who specifically want to dig into this today, then feel free to ask questions. I'll keep an eye on the chat function uh, and uh, then we'll see if we can answer them today. Uh, the one question that has been causing a certain kind of confusion is the uh, Flora handheld uh, and if it's supported by RSVG. Um, and we've had some more clarity on, on this topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, the best, uh, you know, the simplest way for us to summarize this is more to look at the, the uh, try to be factual here and, and not try to sort of cause a sort of, what shall I say, finger pointing exercise. I just want to sort of share with you where we are and then see what we can do in the future. But um, so uh, just to give people a context about this. Uh, so uh, the mobile integration between Iris and, and Floria, now called Floria, uh, that started all back in 2008. And then in 2015, RSVG introduced a public API for this type of integration. And as everybody or most of you know that the partnership, ISBG partnership ended in December. So that's about a year ago. Uh, that also included an agreement that regulated how we could use the software components in RSBG. Uh, and, and we've tried to get such an agreement in place uh, without success. So that's in 2008, uh, in August, I mean, uh, we announced then to switch over to uh, using the public API, uh, the data import API that maybe many of you are familiar with. Uh, that would help us from a practical and technical and also legal perspective. This is was presented in the presentation. Um, so, uh, and, and, and some good news. Uh, so RSBG announced that the API will still be supported, uh, the, the API that was introduced in 2015. However, there was some messages about uh, if it, uh, what it would might require licenses, etc. This has now become clearer. Uh, there is some restrictions to, on this API now. Uh, sadly, this uh, restriction was introduced in 431, and people have installed it uh, unless, but this information wasn't clear in the installation notes. So, so I suppose the good news is that uh, you can, um, uh, you, you, you yourself as a garden decide when you upgrade. So, so uh, we're working on the resolution here, and hopefully this will be resolved. But at this point, uh, Floria works on all versions of Irix except the latest one. And... Uh, yeah, hopefully that will uh, be resolved in the future, but that's the situation at this point. Um, if there are any questions about that, we could take that now. If, if there's anything you want to clarify, other, other than that, please get in touch if you want to uh, sort of discuss this further. I'm just gonna make sure I see the chat here so that, uh, yeah, the chat is very quiet. But uh, uh, so uh, then uh, we will have some room for general questions answer. Uh, later after the main presentation, so so I engage I, I encourage you to uh, engage in that. Uh, we normally have this webinar, uh, uh, and um, at uh, forty five minutes today we might go a bit over because of the topic is quite a f fun one. <laughs> so so we'll see, but uh, but we'll try to keep it within the uh, the full clock hour. So so yeah. Uh, then I would hand over the, uh, yeah, there was one question here, uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, so so Christopher pointed out something here in, in, the, in the chat, so if anybody can read that, that's more to everybody. So then I will uh, look at uh, starting the other presentation, I realize I had the wrong presentation going here, uh, if you bear with me. Um, So then I will uh, take, uh, give the word over to Wahid, who will talk about virtual plant labels and augmented reality potential. Take it away. Thanks, Havard. Lovely to be able to talk in uh, the December 
plant records conference um, and webinar and hopefully uh, we've got some interesting and fun topic lined up. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what augmented reality is and a little a few examples of where they have been used uh, currently in other domains. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about their potential application in our community and also finally lead on to some of the requirements of augmented reality potential and how this can stimulate uh, an interesting discussion, hopefully. So I'll start off um, by introducing Andres, um, who's also a key sort of um, member of the team at Candide. He is an iOS developer and one of the experts in augmented reality which I've just noticed he has the same initials, AR, as augmented reality, which is brilliant. Perfect. Anyway, um, so we'll, we'll, let's first talk about the what I call the evolutionary phylogenetics of reality. It's a bit, it's a bit geeky, I know, but, um, but there we are. So we all know that uh, it starts in real life, which is, well, I don't really need to explain this, but it, it's the real physical life around us. It's, it's not... It's not any digital component, it's, it's reality. And this is where uh, we extend into the world of augmented reality, which is actually a type of technology that's overlaying digital information on top of the real life, the reality that we have to the left. And we can even extend this further to something called merged or mixed reality, which is actually a little bit more immersive and this is the, the merging of both the real world and the digital world in a sort of very digitally enhanced, immersive, interactive way, which I'll actually show you a diagram in a moment um, and, and explain that in a bit more detail. And then finally on this, on this phylogeny, we have virtual reality, which is a completely 100% digital world. And usually this type of technology requires a bit more advanced uh, sort of accompaniments, usually in the form of uh, a, a, an Oculus Rift type uh, device that's a complete covering of your face often. And these three types of reality are generally termed extended reality. So you've got the concept of a real life present reality and then three types of extended reality. Now, most of you probably have heard of virtual reality in, in the context of, of, of life, but uh, today we're going to focus on augmented reality and its applications. So this diagram I have actually pinched from Applied Art and Technology, but it's a really good example of how these three types of extended realities work. So at the beginning we have augmented reality, which I, I touched on, is a digital overlay upon the real world. Uh, so the, the real world is, is the main component of that experience, but it's enhanced through a virtual addition that could be uh, either a text overlay, an image overlay, or, or even an animation type overlay. In the middle, this concept of merged reality is, is a sort of halfway house between augmented reality and virtual reality. The two worlds are actually intertwined and it's a bit more immersive in that you can physically you can digitally and almost physically interact with with components so you can you can start to visualize digital uh, basically digital objects and almost manipulate them and and really interact with, with the two worlds so it's a sort of a really interesting halfway house that, that i've not actually tried myself but I'd, I'd love to at some point and then finally, the, the complete other end of the spectrum, as we discussed, is, is virtual reality. So it's completely immersive, it's fully enclosed, and you have no sense of the real world. It's 100% digital. And that is what requires uh, a, a very specialist uh, tools like this eyepiece that we've got pictured at the bottom right. So I'm going to let's look at uh, a few examples of augmented reality in in other domains. And again, this uh, these next set of examples are some of the ones that Apple 
have featured on their website. So it's not something that I can claim fame to, but uh, there we are. <laughs> so the first one I'm going to talk, uh, show you is, is one by a company called Wabi Parker. Now this is a, an eyeglasses and a sunglasses company. And hopefully from the video, you'll be able to see that it allows people to select different styles of sunglasses or spectacles and sort of visually overlay them on the people's face. So the camera has detected the face, it's detected the digital object, which is the frame, and it's putting that on top of your face as a digital overlay, and you're able to, to see whether you want to purchase this, this type of style. So it's quite a nice little shopping feature. On the theme of shopping, shopping features, um, here's another example from Ikea. Uh, it's called Ikea Place. And it's very cool because it allows you to sense your living room, your kitchen, whatever room it might be. And you can play around with different types of furnishings, different lamps, different colors, different schemes. And you can actually place things in as if they were real in your room before you actually go and buy them. So it's a really, really nice way of, of, of designing your interior layout without actually having to spend a fortune. The next example is one that's specific to plants. So this is called Icecape, not an animation here, unfortunately, but this is uh, an app that helps you visualize your landscape. So it takes account your, your planting, your garden space, your environment around you, and it comes with different packs of plants. So these are often shape, different shapes, different forms, different structures, different colors, etc. And it allows you to virtually place those into your beds, into your planters, etc. So you can see which planting designs and colors might suit your particular space. So again, it's, it's quite a nice little feature to visualize how your garden might look like. And finally, we've got an app called Plantail, um, which is a bit more sophisticated. And actually it allows you to explore a plant virtually. So you're able to see the root structure, the, the, the water running through the plant. You're able to see the cells and the xylem, the phloem, et cetera. And you're able to essentially look after a virtual plant. You sort of start with it as a seed and you see it germinate, you see it grow, and it becomes this virtual, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, what was that? What was that uh, little game that we that kids had? It was like a Tamagotchi, I think it was, where you sort of look after a virtual pet almost. Um, so again, it's quite, quite cool. Um, and in this case, a bit more of an education focus, um, which is also quite nice. But for us, um, what's most interesting, I suppose, is this concept of the plant label. So hopefully in the next slide, um, you should be able to see how the plant label represents that very important link between the accession record and the physical plant that you've got in your collection. And this slide from the Plant Records Conference uh, earlier this month, oh, sorry, last month, um, and it shows that the, the, the basic standard information that's displayed on these labels can vary depending on what the focus of the garden is, but also depending on the focus of the visitor as well. So here are just a few examples of, of what labels might look like in their current state. Uh, some, some places prefer to have their synonyms listed, for example. Others prefer to state the origin uh, of that plant. So the, the point is that the plant label can vary, um, even though it is that forms that really important link between the accession and the plant. Now, why is this important? Well, in the context of augmented reality, it's something that Candide have actually previously explored in the form of Candide labels. So hopefully on the next slide, you'll be able to see that this app was created uh, by Candide in 2018. 
And this was an, an augmented reality app that was primarily created as a, as a sort of hack day exercise. It was sort of a, a, an idea that was born from a day of experimentation. And it actually turned out to receive a lot of attention from Apple when it got released. And the point of this app was to, for, for, to enable people to place virtual uh, or augmented reality labels on their plants at home. And, and these were specifically plants that they already owned. And the point of it was to allow people to seek basic care information about those plants and for them to be able to look after them very easily and have these very simple visual profiles that were specifically targeted for this type of audience. Now, the point is that this, this app that we developed uh, back in 2018 had a slightly higher price of entry simply because AR compatible devices tend to be those at the very forefront of the app, uh, or the, the um, kind of Apple's devices, basically the newest iPhones, the newest Samsungs, etc. They're usually the more expensive uh, devices. So it's usually targeted at a, a slightly different audience uh, where that's concerned. And it was also built to provide a, a nice entry point into the main app that we have that a lot of you probably have heard of that I won't go into today. And the point is that this seems like a, a simple experience, placing a virtual label on a plant and getting to the plant care information, but actually it involves a lot of complex processes and a lot of expertise from different groups of people. So we have the computer scientists who make the actual programming side of things. We've got a group of botanists and horticulturalists who take care of the plant care information. Then we've got plant identification features as part of this experience. So enabling people to actually identify the plant before they put the label on it. And that requires machine learning and sort of uh, machine learning processes basically. And, and it also requires a, an infrastructure that underpins the whole augmented reality experience. So it requires AR programmers. And all of that has to be tidied with very neat design and animation. And the point is that though we released this intentionally as a, a little bit of an experiment, we found that it got global reach. So we found that across the world, people loved to download the app, to label their plants, and to really interact with their plants in quite a nice and kind of friendly way. And again, going back to the original point of it was to enable people to find the plant care information for those plants. So it's a nice, nice digitally enhanced way of interacting with your plants. I've got here a video of how it works. Here's Andres taking Actually, he's not taking a picture. He's actually got auto identification enabled. Basically, this means that the, the camera can actually detect where the plant is and actually automatically identify it without having to take a picture. So this has required a little bit more sophisticated technology. And you can see that it's able to identify the plant and put a virtual label on it within seconds. And you can see now that he's done his whole table that they all kind of stay in the position of that particular plant because it's going by coordinate data from the smartphone's camera. You can also see in the next slide that this can also potentially be applied in an outdoor setting. And if the video plays, yeah, brilliant. Uh, you can see that this particular bed has been labeled uh, actually at Sherbourne Castle in Dorset, if anybody knows the garden. And you can see that though those particular plants have been labelled in that bed and you can still retain that information on the smartphone, which is really nice. So the point is that you, it, it's giving us a nice way of interacting with those plants. And of course, it's plastic free. So there's no need for that complex signage or 
different sort of leads going to those plants because you've got that ability and option to interact with them digitally. And as I mentioned earlier, it's been very globally well received and a lot of people seem to love just simply labeling their plants, which is great. And this here's another example of actually a member of the community um, having labeled their plants in their front garden and sharing that um, with the rest of Candide, Candide's users. So it's, it's a nice integration of many expertise and it enables even, even the, the beginner and the expert horticulturalist to sort of label plants uh, virtually, which is great. So one of the things uh, I wanted to talk about in this, in this webinar was how this might be applied in other areas um, for botanic gardens. So here are a couple of examples that kind of, they're not, it's not an exhaustive list, of course, but uh, just some quick examples that we came up with. Um, and one of them was that augmented reality could be used on family beds and taxonomic beds that are obviously very important in botanic gardens for many reasons. Um, and it can sort of, we know that, well, we know that uh, systematic beds in particular, plants are organized according to how they're related. And this can form a really important part of the garden's educational program and the way they communicate plant taxonomy to, to visitors. So that's certainly one, one potential aspect that this type of labeling system could be utilized. But, it, but because it's a digital, it's a digital sort of uh, medium, we could also look at things like seasonal comparisons of plants. So you could take a, a bed, for example, in the winter and in summer, even in other seasons, and be able to overlay that visual information upon the bed. So you can start to see the seasonal comparison of, the, of that bed at different times of the season. It could also be used for things like ethnobotany. So we know that plants and humans have very interesting connections and we could look at things like medicinal plants and how they're, they're applied uh, and also even things like taking the, a willow, for example, and, and seeing some aspirin coming from it or something. Uh, so, so really the, the potential is, is pretty, uh, sort of, it, could, it can be anything really. Um, and uh, the last example I've got here is, is kitchen gardening. So uh, I can potentially imagine taking chilies and spices and being able to combine those into some nice cookery style educational kind of concept. Um, so yeah, the point is that it, it's sort of uh, uh, so so broad, which is why it's so exciting. But the one thing I wanted to go into a little bit more detail was this concept of family beds or taxonomic beds, which have been uh, an integral part of botanic gardens for, for really centuries. And here are a few examples. Again, this list isn't exhaustive, but here are a few examples that you might be familiar with. So Cambridge Garden, Cambridge University Botanic Garden, Hortus Botanicus in Leiden, Oxford University Botanic Garden, and Longwood Gardens in, in, in the US. And here you can actually see their orchid collection, an orchid exhibit, where they've got a nice collection from the Orchidaceae that's sort of in pots, but full of labels. And the point is that, that these specific family taxonomic beds can provide one solution uh, through the form of AR. If we go as an example for at Cambridge, it's nice because they have a very historic systematic bed, uh, basically that was uh, originated in the mid 1800s by the garden's first curator, Andrew Murray. And actually, the work that he did as part of that um, actually was to translate one of the most comprehensive botanical books of the time into a design feature for, for really teaching plant taxonomy. And it's interesting that even today, that, that uh, sort of seminal work forms the part of the Code for Botanical Nomenclature, this origin of cultivated plants by 
Alphonse de, de Condel. And the point is that the, the, the rich heritage value that these systematic beds have, their value really is totally uninterpreted. And in the case for Cambridge, they had a very exciting three-year project called Understanding Plant Diversity, which aimed to revitalize that, those beds basically, and, and the, the relevance of these beds uh, for public understanding of plant taxonomy. So in terms of public outreach, the, the value is, is really has been untapped and unrealized until fairly recently. And here's the, the result of their efforts in, in reinvigorating their systematic beds and the interpretation of them. Uh, and it's really promoted the, the outreach of plant taxonomy uh, and, and systematics and also their plant collection in, in a particular way that's engaging to, to the type of visitor that, that, that goes to Cambridge. And here you can see a few examples of the, the types of exhibits that they have there. So what are the key components um, of an augmented reality experience? Well, we sort of touched a little bit upon the engineering or infrastructure that underpins the whole experience, but also there's that botanical element. So this could be plant records data, it could be other form of botanical data or botanical content, and, and that content could be individualized for particular gardens, for particular collections, for particular audiences, because we know different gardens have different visitors and different uh, types of collections that are suited for a specific purpose. And finally, the other part of an augmented reality experience is if you want it to be location specific, it requires a trigger. So in the case for Candide labels, those labels were placed on plants, either automatically or manually. But if you wanted an experience to be triggered for a particular systematic bed or a particular group of plants, it might require something like a QR code or an NFC tag or a particular feature that is that initial trigger for that experience. So the, 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 the whole sort of componentized structure of, of an experience involves some key pillars that it's important to, to be aware of, especially in, when it comes to different connections between the botanical data and the content and the way it's overlaid onto a particular feature within that garden. So let's talk about, we, we've heard a little bit about how they might be applied, but it's also important to think of more generally how augmented reality and a, a digital tool such as that could improve sort of various components and parts of, of a visitor's experience in a garden, but also to think about other requirements that would be part of that journey. So some of the advantages we've heard are that it can enhance the communication uh, within a garden, it can really improve that experience as, as an educational tool. Can we go next, Tavad? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and we can also have a, uh, a, special, a special sort of interest groups that can, can guide the way that that sort of solution behaves. As I, as I mentioned, different groups of visitors, different groups of collections for research history, um, and also the cultural history side of things. It, it can guide that solution in, in many different ways because it is a digital form of content, meaning there are so many more possibilities. It also means that there is less of a crowded space. So there is no need for plastic labels or excessive signage and other physical elements. And actually in the case of the systematic beds example, it may even lower the resources in terms of physical resources because it will permit planting combinations that, that would otherwise not be possible. So take, for example, um, angiosperm evolution and the very early, uh, what, what used to be called anita grade plants. And some of these 
cannot be grown so easily outdoors or in greenhouses, etc. So being able to virtually uh, grow them or virtually project the information about them using augmented reality has certainly a really um, exciting potential. Because it's also digital, it also means that updates and corrections and image enhancements, etc., all of that side of things will be immediate. There's no delay in producing signage, in sort of getting it printed, getting it for weatherproofed, etc. It's sort of all there digitally and accessible through compatible devices. And though that initial experience infrastructure is generalized, so for example, it could be a, a phylogeny for that particular taxonomic group. The point is, once you have that initial phylogeny in place, the content that you overlay in that phylogeny can be very easily customized because the investment has been undertaken to build that initial infrastructure. However, of course, there are a number of requirements for such uh, quite advanced technology. As, as we heard right at the very beginning of, of the webinar, some of the additional devices and uh, tools that, that you have to, to, to have to be able to experience it. And in the case of augmented reality, not all devices are capable of seeing, being able to, to see that augmented reality overlay and be able to detect where you want to place that. So one option could be that, that gardens or institutions have loan devices that enable visitors or people to, to really experience and to in, uh, engage with, with that augmented reality content. The resources are often costly. So in terms of build time, creating that initial infrastructure is, is a costly process. It involves a lot of expertise as we, we talked about earlier. And it may require an appropriate link to the plant data of a botanic garden or a particular collection. So though, it's, though it can be customized, if it's going to be very specific to, to a botanic garden, it might require an appropriate link to be able to project that information uh, accurately onto that. And also talking about specific location-based experiences, they, the precision for those actually requires anchor points. So the camera, the smartphone's camera or device's camera has to be able to detect where you are to in order before it can sort of place uh, a, a virtual image onto that particular point. So often in areas that are more complex in nature, it requires a triangulation of where you are. And there are various mechanisms and technologies in place for that, such as Bluetooth beacons, there's Wi-Fi, of course, but there's also things like magnetic field detection. And though outdoors, we know that there's GPS, for example, the precision of GPS can vary especially in gardens that might be a bit more remote. So the precision for particular location-based AR experiences might vary. So that is also an important consideration. And it, that could also be affected by light and weather and all sorts of other environmental factors, especially if there's an object that's being identified as part of the experience. So that's a, also a, a requirement or a consideration at least for very specific uh, location-based experiences, which is why things like QR codes and NFC tags are that physical anchor point enabling the smartphone to detect where and when that augmented reality experience will start. So that's the advantage of, of using something like that. And also there's the more general sort of issue of being able to balance your screen time with green time. So we don't want people to, to be glued to their phones. We want them to be able to interact with, with the outdoor environment, but also not be sort of technology focused. But, uh, so that's also a, an obvious issue. And 
last point is safety. So I think in 2016, uh, there was a, an outroar with um, Pokemon Go, actually, which I don't know many of you probably heard of, but it was an augmented reality game where people had to collect Pokemon characters uh, by chasing them through streets and through hidden places. And there was a number of cases where people actually got injured when crossing, not looking when they're crossing roads because they were so engrossed in, in catching these Pokemon in, in augmented reality. Obviously not so much of an issue when you're looking at a bed of plants, but, uh, <laughs> but maybe, maybe it is, who knows. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's also a really interesting point. So I guess that leads on to the final topic is uh, really to open up the floor for a discussion uh, and whether people think this type of advanced technology, augmented reality, whether it really has a future in botanic garden visitation or even the interpretation of, of collections and even plant record keeping um, and, and whether there's, there's a future for, for this type of technology there. So I think I'll probably end it there and I'll pass you over back to Havard who might be able to send a little survey out. Yeah, thank you very much, Wahid. Uh, yeah, before we open the floor for a bit of a discussion, uh, we'll, we'll run a quick poll, uh, a sort of a, uh, a little launch a bit of a poll here so that we can get a sense of what people think about this. So the question will be, uh, if this technology would be available to you, where do you think it will be best applied in your garden? And uh, you can tick off several boxes. There's one box called other where you cannot comment here. So if you see other applications, put it in the comment in the chat, please. And then um, we'll give you a minute or so to respond. And this is not compulsory. So do feel free to ignore it. And it's all also, uh, yeah, uh, we don't know who's voting. <laughs> so <laughs> here we go. Am I allowed to take part in this? Survey, have I? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think we'll leave it to the audience. We're good. We got uh, forty percent voted already. That's brilliant. There's one question on the chat, if you could look at that, uh, Wahid, for when we... Yeah, we'll do it for... Uh, it seems to stabilize. We'll let it go for 15 more seconds. Somebody is still thinking, raise your hand and say stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, Five more seconds and then we'll we got 86 percent of the audience voted that's good and uh, i'm going to share the result with you uh, so as you can see um there's a lot of uh, interest in um maybe you could comment on your on on the conclusions uh, Wahid, if you don't mind yeah this is this is great this is really interesting actually so it's I mean, the systematics example um, that I talked about was obviously just one of many cases, but it seems that uh, the audience are more favoring the general interpretation side of things, uh, but also tour guiding, so navigational. So that's a really good point um, in terms of navigation, um, because I can see certainly with different, for example, different trails in botanic gardens or different waypoints or different sort of um, collection focused guides uh, around gardens. So if you want to go on the, on the Orchidaceae tour, follow the augmented reality uh, sort of path. <laughs> um, I can see certainly that, that side of things. Um, do we, are we able to see the other? 
Yeah, so there were some uh, comments on other on the chat. So I can see uh, Courtney, yes. if you want to share your thoughts, so it's optional, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. Well, we do um, an annual orchid exhibit. Well, every other year. So I think it, I guess it could fall under general interpretation, but being able to use the labels there. And then also we have some forested areas that we find really difficult just for record keeping and to interpret that aren't accessible by walkways. So it'd be nice to have um, that used as well. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Yeah, I see p sort of similar thoughts. You're on mute. And it's very hard. If even if you do put a label in, people can't see them, uh, and so you could, you know they could see that a lot easier. Um, and the other other area, where it, yeah, if you have a general um, naturalized areas where you don't want to label it, so you can actually just add, you know, when a native plant comes up or something like, you can add a label to that, and you can change those around each year, something like that. Yeah, uh, we missed. Uh, sorry, we, you, I'm, you were muted in the beginning. What you, the, your introduction to was that uh, deep naturalized borders? Yeah, so so uh, um, herbaceous bed, deep deep herbaceous beds where the planting, even if you've got a label on the plants, they're quite a long way away from the public, so they can't see them as well as naturalized beds. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's an interesting point on accessibility, isn't it? It's being able to either access parts of the garden or access particular plant labels and being able to have a digital solution for that will overcome some of these accessibility issues, which is interesting. Um, plants inside animal exhibits. That's certainly interesting. Do do we want to S book out? Sorry, do you want to... Shari, is, uh, are you able to elaborate a bit further? This is uh, San Diego Zoo and uh, the, some, oh. some in the exhibits you don't want to go into, I'm sure. <laughs> well, uh, I, I know just I, I've attended some of these uh, sort of conferences with uh, with the zoo, zoo botanical conferences and the interpretation there is, of course, extremely interesting in the relation between plants and animals. And I also know that, uh, you know, I had a long session about planting in a baboon enclosure. You know, <laughs> it's sort of all the plants that we've torn up and eaten up. So there's very little you can plant. But of course, from a from a storytelling perspective, uh, you have, there's a lot of interesting plants you would like to plant. So so that's an interesting, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. No, and, and of course, yeah, putting labels in an exhibit in itself, like Shari's mentioning here, is, is not easy. To, <laughs> they will just be pulled up, unless you're dealing with sort of slow snakes or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, just to expand on that uh, that concept you mentioned there, you know, if you have the uh, bamboo or the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, baboon enclosure, and you couldn't grow plants in there because they were destroyed. You could have virtual plants that popped up that you could talk about what they feed upon or what they utilize in their natural environment, even if the plants weren't physically there. Yeah, yeah, now, that's a good point. Now we actually came up with another one. You could introduce animals into your botanic garden. How about <laughs> that? <laughs> it would yeah. also, I suppose, overcome uh, specific, specifically valuable collections as well or particularly valuable plants that you might only have one of but you don't want people to sort of potentially trample over it for example but still be able to see it and learn about it so it could also be a, a nice example of of showcasing those specimens yeah and you also mentioned the the whole story about systematic beds and and of course extinct plants uh, it's sort of no-brainer but it's sort of I don't know how is it like this way over ninety percent of all existing flora is gone already kind of thing or not existing obviously but historic flora so so you could create some interesting stories if you go virtual yeah 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 as an educational tool I think yeah it's it's certainly uh, lots of potential um, not just within plant taxonomy but yeah as we saw in in one of the examples at the very beginning that plant tail. Uh, seeing different components of the plant, the, the xylem, the phloem, the root architecture, 
um, and, and also, yeah, this is, that's also a really interesting point. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, see if there's any other comments or thoughts about virtual plant labels. Um, obviously, people might want to use it at home as well and all over the place. I think uh, from a plant record, uh, we haven't discussed that, but uh, from a collection management point of view, for uh, the classic question that often comes up is is uh, epiphytes and uh, you know how do you label those and the, you suddenly have a 3D space to work with. It opens up quite a lot of opportunities that way as well in terms of keeping track of where things is, not necessarily just label it, but being able to access and and bulbs that are gone, uh, you know, they, they're not there in this obviously. Uh, but when you're out there doing inventory, being able to sort of find dormant plants without having to, um, uh, yeah, talk to the expert who actually planted it half a year ago or five years ago. So yeah, there's a there's a number of opportunities that not necessarily is purely visitation, but also, uh, yeah, uh, practical day daytime tools kind of thing. So. Yeah. Sorry, I can't find the raise hand button, <coughs> but um, <laughs> I wanted to uh, uh, to uh, yeah to put to put in a, a thought because we're actually actually at the moment working on the renovation of, of greenhouses and planning for uh, for uh, design um, landscape and interpretation design uh, altogether. Um, and I think one of the questions that we'll be discussing is, do you actually want to uh, put the device between uh, 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 the, the people and the plant? Uh, is this a way to overcome plant blindness or are you just raising an extra um, a hurdle to, to, to get to information? What, what we see in the garden here is we have a little, um, little bit of text on the, on the labels in, in the garden in Amsterdam. And uh, that's just, I think, 40 words or something, very short, uh, very selected uh, text. Uh, but what you often see is that people are strolling through the garden and are enjoying a little bit of text and are, are, are moving on. Um, so you're actually, I, th I feel that we're actually reaching um, people that are not actively looking for information and not, not wanting to go all the way to go like, oh, I'm gonna go for it, you know, and uh, do this, uh, but still have a lot of sort of help the interaction between plants and people um, without the device. So yeah, this is something I'm wondering how, uh, how um, yeah, what, what, what are your th thoughts about that, uh, Wahid? Yeah, I mean, I think I can perhaps see a case for uh, maybe an indoor environment where we don't want everybody out with their smartphones, but you could have like a display device, a display iPad or a display iPhone that's projecting augmented reality information that's specific to that uh, planting bed or that greenhouse. So that's one way of overcoming it. So the information is there for people, but they don't have to get their phone out and sort of become engrossed in, in their notifications and et cetera. But, but they can still experience it. So that might be one, one way of overcoming that, perhaps. So you're, you're talking about like a, like a kind of an interactive information uh, panel. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so people can yeah. still sort of engage in an, in an immersive yeah. way without it taking over too much of their own sort of yeah. device. That, that could be one way. Yeah. Like an iPad on a tripod or something, you could swing around to different areas and see from one central point. Yep. So like the telescopes they have on, uh, on like large buildings and different features. What, what, I, what I would guess is that it would probably, the first kind of garden implementations of this would probably likely to be uh, geared towards one specific purpose and maybe also for one dedicated area. So, so you, you, as a visitor, you understand, okay, now we're in the, like you have in a museum as well, you, you often have these kind of thematical areas where there's stuff going on and then you realize, oh, uh, oh, now I should grab my phone or not and kind of thing. Uh, I think that, that but, but I agree with you. You sort of create a full fledged botanic garden where you should, you're sort of asked to use your phone all the way <laughs> through. I think that's uh, hopefully not happening anyway, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that I think what's happened. I, my my guess point is that's a lot to learn from the museums. But but 
but they're indoor often and they're, but they have done some of this already uh, and I'm guessing also that uh, getting it getting some experience in the in the community that will be a very good guideline of how this might be used and applied uh, but uh, yeah there's a but you point right out it's very good in that the, the all the surveys points to the fact that people come to the garden a lot of them just want to enjoy the green space well and, and uh, yeah well, actually, the flip side of this, I think, is also true, is then you can use your physical labels in a much more curated way. So um, uh, now some gardens are sea of labels, <clears throat> and sometimes we label plants that are not necessarily the plants that we really want visitors to see, but we label them anyways because we need to label everything, otherwise we can't properly curate our collections. But I think virtual plant labels allows us potentially, depending on how you use it, I think there's a possibility of labeling then what you want people to see and you can highlight the plants that you want everybody to see and you have <clears throat> the possibility to yeah, really highlight those plants um, with physical labels and have the virtual plant labels for the rest and, and have changing focuses and stuff like that uh, with um, just like museums have sometimes so I, uh, with um, displays and exhibitions and stuff. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, it's, it's, it's still a long way to look at the balance of this, but I think it definitely has, uh, it has a flip side as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's a sort of a reminder always that like technology for the sake of technology is not, never works, but finding sort of applications where the enhancement of, of, of visitation or whatever is very obvious. That's where we might have a winner. So yeah, I, I'm conscious of time. I see that it's uh, one minute left. Uh, so I think uh, maybe people uh, might want to hang around for a few more minutes, but I'll, I'm going to sort of round off now and say thank you so much for joining. Uh, so for those of you who have signed up, we're now going to run this series every second month, similar time, first Thursday of every second month. Uh, we'll pick up this uh, discussion and and we'll send out an invite. Uh, well, you have the calendar invite, most of you already. If you don't, just send an email to webinar at botanicalsoftware.com. Uh, and uh, what will be the next topic uh, uh, in two months' time? Uh, we don't know yet, but hopefully equally exciting. And thank you so much for joining. And happy, uh, what is the political correct uh, term here? Happy holidays, happy December. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, for those of you on the other side of the planet, happy summer. And uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. I'll stop the recording and then we can have a casual chat uh, uh, after the recording is ended. Thank you so much. <laughs>